you know when you hear a song uh, or, a, or a collection of songs that literally make you shiver you know that feeling so songs that can make you cry i mean it's kind of easy to make me cry these days to be fair um those songs that make you cry at how effortlessly beautiful they are um a thing that's been interesting me over you know the sort of past uh you know couple of years really sort of since i started this podcast i suppose but i don't i you know, I, don't, I don't pretend to know anything about it but the stuff that, the stuff that interests me is the is the kind of the neuroscience of how you know some pieces of music can really transport me to you know to a time a place an older version of me perhaps an unseen version of me how they can seem you know like my constant companion that's seen my life you know the very you know the depths of me the heights of me you know and how i can go back to them and they're still my friend they're never my enemy um you know those companions of of, of sort of devotion years down the line I do, I do think about this a lot you know uh well my my guest today is is about to do all those sort of things again with with her next album, which is called Sunseeker, and it's out on the twenty second of March. If I got my dates right, um, and it builds on previous albums, In the Seams and Tomorrow Again, which are really two masterpieces in my book. You know that that phrase, all all killer, no filler. Well, here you go. This is this has got it. And for one thing, it's got it's got sort of horns and and anything that's got horns in it is, is good in my book. And it's got a signature chord progressions which and harmonies which just tie me up in knots. It's so good. So it's an absolute joy to have Becky Jones, aka Saint Saviour, here with me. Becky, welcome and thanks so much for taking the time. Great to see you. Oh, wow, what a lovely intro. Thank you. Not at all. It's a pleasure. So it, it, I, I think by the time this this comes out, the 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 record will be sort of imminent but you know obviously i've had a listen to it it's really really phenomenal and like i said i think you know it kind of builds on the previous previous two lps you know which were just amazing and it's uh it, and again it's just a, a fabulous record thank you so much that's really kind how's it um i mean a broad kind of big question how's it been for you writing the album and then get, and getting to this stage where we are now it's been very, very long, to be honest. It's taken a really long time from uh, beginning to write the songs to mm. um, record the songs and then start putting a plan together as to, you know, what, what the title will be and how it will be presented. And yeah, um, and we're still tweaking now the artwork. Um, so... Yeah, it's been long, 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 a saga. And the album has actually had uh, a few kind of twists and turns mm. stylistically. Um, at the at the very beginning, I made a mood board of my kind of vision for the style and the reference points that yes. I did you know, want to use to kind of anchor my songwriting process. Um, and I'm not sure how much of that's survived the 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 creating process and, mm. and you know on the record, which which is no no problem at all. I'm 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 perfectly happy with that. I think maybe I needed to explore something um quite bold to get back into songwriting and then explore some new ideas. Mm. And then at the end of the day, my music will just be, it's, I, I've, what I've realized is there's nothing that's, there's nothing that's going to sort of um, disguise my artistic voice. Cause what basically getting to make this a bit clearer, what I was trying to do at the beginning, I was trying to make something a bit kookier and a bit um, a bombastic. Mm. Uh, and my, I, I was listening to a lot of six, um, late sixties stuff into the seventies. Yeah. Um, I suppose a bit progressive and a bit um, psychedelic in places as well. I was listening to a lot of. It started out um, with the left bank, mm. and the reason I, I got into the left bank was that I, I've always loved Jens Lechman. Mm. And he's got this incredible album that you can't find anywhere called You're So, oh, You're so Silent, Jens. And it's just full of amazing samples of old tunes. And that's probably why you can't get hold of it. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, but when I was looking through what he'd sampled, because I was just really interested in how you put together an album like that, where it's because I love collage as a medium generally. Yeah, and okay. I've always, you know, growing up listening to a lot of hip hop, mm. I love that idea of making musical collage from samples. You know, a lot of the hip hop hip hop records that I loved when I was growing up, they use amazing old um, yeah. funk and soul samples and stuff. And so I, I liked that approach and I was inspired by Jens to think about that. But then about a month in, I realized, oh, that's going to be so hard to do, you know, for, for the rights, to get the rights yeah. for the samples for an album <clears throat> from samples. So then I started to think about the songwriting techniques, the chords, the sounds, um, the types of melody, the types of themes. Yeah. And, and yeah, Jens sampled the left bank on one of his tunes. Um, and what was the left bank tune called? Uh, my memory is is really scattergun. So um, there's absolutely <clears throat> no point in asking me. I won't remember at all. <laughs> so it was. I've got something on my mind. Okay. By the left <clears throat> bank, and it starts with like this sort of really <clears throat> harmon. Um, What's it called again? A harpsichord. Yeah, yeah. And so I started to play with that and the harpsichord sound and the kind of chords and the tempo and the beat. Mm. And I started to sort of pull pull musical ideas together through stuff like that record by the left bank and mm. a lot of zombie stuff. And then I got really into a female artist called Margot Guerin. Mm. Um, who's actually a pianist, but she um, she made at least one album, I think, of these beautiful, smoky, sultry, um, bluesy, vaudevillian, late 60s albums. Mm. And then through that, I got really into the that kind of French, 60s French pop. Um, and I just love the sort of the smoky nonchalance of those yeah. kind, of that kind of music um and then british artists like you know jarvis cocker's solo stuff and mm. a lot of griff reese has that kind of really interesting mix of eccentricity and irreverence yeah. and daftness but melodies are always so beautiful incredible the, the architecture of the music is yeah. just so powerful agree and brilliant pop just brilliant pop music, but that kind of um, vintage mm. side. Of it. Yeah. And that was the sort of cloud that I was in for the beginning of the album. I was trying to make upbeat, outward looking, bold, silly, cartoony music. And um, I probably just got too into that because then, I mean, a bit into the process, I realized, can I get away with this? does my voice sort of because my voice is quite soft can I can I you know um bolster it enough to sit on top of these big um boom boom bong on bong on bong boom, 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 boom mm. drums and stuff and it all got a bit tangled up with itself um mm. <clears throat> so then I uh I went up to Liverpool area to to the Wirral yeah. And we started from scratch again with Bill Ryder Jones. Mm. And you know, he's amazing. He's a he's a great friend and a beautiful person. And he also he understands those references, but um maybe also how to uh I think he knows me really well because we've made music before and he knows how maybe quite uh, my voice is quite fragile and yeah, I don't know. It just it sort of fell together in a, in a more mm. gentle way. Mm. And so I think it's some of the tracks are still a bit eccentric, and they, you can hear those references in in the in the songwriting and in the arrangement as well. Because Bill was just an absolute genius arranger. Yeah. But somehow my voice, the 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 arrangements are very sort of sympathetic to the soft voice sound and. Mm. The, that I often accidentally end up creating. Yeah, I mean it's interesting though. I mean that's that's one th one thing that that 
that came across it that and and, and I've I've noticed this happen. Maybe I'm just I'm just personally I'm just sort of more aware, self aware of what I'm hearing when I listen to, to music. That that this this kind of notion of um, music that sounds familiar yet unfamiliar. And and you know there's there's a lot of it that is very you, and then there are parts of it that's that are that are different, that that are perhaps unexpected. Which which I like, you know, I, I like that where you get something that that is, you can see the evolution, and there's there's bits in it that are that are kind of different, but it's not not so different that it's going to be unrecognizable. Which you know, it, to be fair, you know, in some cases is is very merited as well. Mm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think that uh, I'm thinking of a particular song at the moment. I'm thinking of the next tune that is coming out. Mm. Uh, it's called "Be Gentle." Yeah, and it's indicative of the the thing I've always. I mean, it's it, struggle sounds negative, you know, but you know. It's like Jacob wrestling with the angel. Yeah, mm. you come out, <laughs> you come out yeah. some, uh, hobbled, but wiser. Um, I don't know why I, why I went off onto that tangent, but um, yeah, I, I wrestle with stuff because I love all music, and I'm I'm wrestling with my wilder, more idiosyncratic reference points a lot, mm. and trying to work out how on earth do I use this, but still keep my own mm. ideas at the, at the end of it and um be gentle is an example of me exploring something pretty eccentric and it, it just it is a part of my personality it, it, i am interested in you know telling st uh strange stories that you don't expect to hear in pop music um yeah I, i'm really interested in history so sometimes I'll sort of weave in a story that's completely about, you know, a Tudor person or um, someone from a workhouse and people think it's a love song, but it, it's not really. It's about this historical story. Mm. Um, and Be Gentle is one of them. It's um, It sounds like a sort of fun pop romp. Mm. Um, and it is. It's it's massive fun. So wait, wait. So back, back, when you mentioned earlier about you, you know, you like in the in the origination of the of the sort of the ideas, you mentioned two words, bombastic and kooky. Yeah. Is, was, is, that, is that the the kooky side of it? Is that is that a, a, what you're saying there about you know desire to tell eccentric stories and and release that part of you, your mm -hmm. your kind of personality? Yeah, I've always I've always had that, but I've I've sort of. Uh, woven it into I think basically I use abstraction a lot in my songwriting especially in my lyricism mm. so the song means something so different to me to the meaning that other people take from it yeah because I don't know I, I I really respect lyricists who can tell a very fluent story and it feel literal mm. And I've never managed to do that. I've never, I've never managed to tell a fluent story that it, it's obvious what it's about. I don't. Yeah. You know, I yeah, actually yeah. through my process. I sort of. I'm always like looking down on the room rather than being in the room. Mm. And um, be gentle is about. Um, it's about a Plantagenet story, you know, because I got really interested in. The Wars of the Roses for a long time when yeah, I was in it. Yeah. And it's just about um a female um member of that family. But it just sounds like a funny pop song. Mm. But the lyrics are basically about her her execution and her ghost. So yeah. I I kinda like the um the you, you know, the sort of the abstraction. And and the ability for me to interpret it differently to what it means to you. Like just before we before we started recording, we we're talking about David Carson and this sort of artwork and this, you know, as the words bleed off the page, so it makes your brain think about what that word is. You just don't see it, and it just goes. You you actually have to think about it. So I kind of like thinking about 
lyrics about you know what they you know what possibly was going through your mind when you were writing it which of course you know i can't i can't possibly know but it's kind of good to it's a good challenge to think about it but then interpreting that in for for me and what's going on in my life i appreciate there's there, the there's time for very literal lyrics and you know they work in scenarios but there are other times when kind of abstract when it really makes you think is is the right way to go yeah um like i say i do i find it very i find it really interesting i i think it's it's something that i'll i don't think i'll ever get to because um <clears throat> it it my personality and my the way my brain works wouldn't allow me to get to ever articulate very very clearly exactly what i mean and it's something that mm behind everything I do you know um and it, it's I think it's a great it's it, you know there's room for everything and um what I what I really enjoy about the process of finishing music and and it took me a while to get used to this actually but finishing music and realizing that once it's out it's not really yours anymore mm. um, it does your your giving these melodies and these words they they're taken and they they find homes in people's playlists and they mean something to that person and that person you know has every right to own them and take them and and mm. find in them and that, and that I find that when I first realized that I realized I couldn't control my repertoire really once it's out it's got a life of its own mm. And I struggled with that at first, but I learned to love. I, lo I learned to love that as a concept. That, you know, people, the fans and the listeners, they have every right to it, and it's theirs now, sort of thing. What What do you think you struggled with as part of that? Was it, was it the because it's you that's created it, and it's it's sort of personal, and it's almost like this is this is this is mine, and you then releasing it. Yeah, it was um, that I had a with my debut album. Um, I, it's one of those interesting situations where, and maybe it's part of the my generation of music makers, and 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 all of the future generations. There's the artist development now takes place in front of the audience. Yeah, and when I came through first making music, you know, in my early twenties, mm. it was that time when everyone was putting all of their demos online and, you know, the process was completely, there was no mystery and everyone was part yeah. of the process. You know, your fans would tell you what the album listing should be. Your fans would tell you um, which song they want to hear live. And, mm. and that's still, that's, that's all fine, you know, but, there were other things that went on, like for example, I did a pledge campaign to fund and that album. Yeah. And so it meant me sort of opening my house to people as well. People could come and, you know, spend a day writing with me or and it was like a strange time in history where we just opened ourselves up completely. Um and yeah. and then and then once that album was made and released, uh I in hindsight I look back at it and I felt like it wasn't great and I wanted to take it down I wanted to delete it wow. I wanted to get rid of it from um, Spotify and <clears throat> you know in trying to do that I was confronted by the argument of you know you have to just face it you know it it, it belongs to them now you can't just take it down because I got some pushback from that and I got um I was forced to consider that argument that um there are a lot of people that actually really love it and still to this day one of the tracks from that album is my I think it's my third most streamed tune and it just it just comes back and comes back and then it'll get synced on a TV show yeah. and it'll come back again people seem to really like it and it's such a I'd struggle to put that song into a set list now, mm. um, but 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 it's a favourite of you know a lot of my 
fan base. Yeah. I guess it's sort of reminiscent of a you know going back to that sort of time and place for 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 for, for people. You know, aside from just, you know, just loving the song. This is what music music does. I mean, for, for, you know, for for you I guess it's uh you know, for any any kind of catalog of stuff that that I guess it applies equally, you know, for anything that we do in our past, that's who we were at that at that particular time, you know, for anything, you know, decisions that we take, you know, stuff that we do, that's that's kind of us. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it it's takes a lot longer now to actually it takes longer to um for me to write record and then release a song so Mm. um, I've got a longer period to edit playlists and think about which songs will make it and which songs won't whereas Mm. in those days it was just all you know you 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 write a tune on Ableton you record it and you quickly put it out as an EP you know Mm. weeks later and it all happens in this frully frully but what what word am I trying to say uh (laughs) frully of uh excitement and probably a lot of vanity as well i think vanity is a big part of it mm. and and then two years later you're like ah actually that sounds really pompous and my voice sounds ridiculous and yeah but people like that so it's, inter- it's interesting the um you know how you how you view you know a piece of music at a certain time and uh what what are Episodes that I recorded a, came out a couple of times, a couple of episodes ago. Excuse me. But he was saying he's got basically like a folder full of files of music that he created maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. And he said he, he literally called the, the folder dog shit. He said this this is never going to see the light of day and, and ignored it for years and years. Then went back to it and was like, hmm. Maybe I was a little bit harsh. That's what, this is a, some of these are actually quite good. I could I could sort of use them, and and it's interesting that again that you know talking about mindset that you know what makes you think that actually now it's great, but then you look back at it in a few years time and you think mm, not sure, and then vice versa. How I, I don't know. I, th- I think it's it's really interesting how music can be, um, you know, your interpretation or, or perception of it could change over over time yes absolutely it's a big part of my process now the process that I've used for um the last definitely the last two albums is a huge uh, what I do is I actually embed a huge amount of reflection time into my songwriting process yeah so I, I write melodies and I don't ever write lyrics first I write loads and loads of melodies and um, create tracks of, um, I call them nuggets. So mm. um, a verse into a chorus and it's just the melody. It's just me sort of scatting and yeah. sometimes I might have a sentence. And Be Gentle was actually one of the those that, that I just had that line. And then I'll sort of scat the rest of it and fill out the blanks. And I I make about 20 of them in a week and then... I'll walk and walk and walk for the next week. I'll just walk eight hours a day mm. listening to them with that perspective of, you know, I've not listened to them for a week or so. Yeah. And I just go and sort of surprise myself with them. Yeah. Get my headphones out on the street walking. And um, and then I make little notes like, number one, rubbish. Number two, amazing. Number three, needs a bit of work for the B section, but the A section is amazing. Mm. And and then number five might be, oh, my God, best melody I've ever written. And I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. So it's about sort of engineering um, and time for perspective to change. Yeah. Um, and I, it's I, so exciting to do that. I yeah. Find, you know, because I'll be walking along listening to myself going. And. um I can't remember writing it. I, I don't know where on earth it's come from. Yeah. Uh, I, t- I sort of take myself by surprise with some of the weird stuff that I've I've written. 
and some of the brilliant melodies and, mm. and some of the stuff that I thought was good, but now I think is really, really awful. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you have you have got like an amazing knack for for, for melody and and okay. harmonies and things like that. It's, it's incredible. I think that's just like a. I mean, I I kind of pick up. I'm not sure that you know, not not alone in this, but I kind of particularly sort of pick up on that because, um, you know, I was I was classically trained, you know, as a musician. Right, I played, yeah. the, played, played the cello when I was a kid up until you know, kind of ages sixteen or seventeen, and you know, <clears throat> I was playing classical music, which is obviously, you know, the kind of the melody and harmony structures in classical is you know is very obvious i i always when, when i hear those sort of harmonies and melodies that you sort of put together it just like immediately kind of gets me oh, that's really lovely. Just... yeah i heard it i was listening to an episode yesterday where you were talking about the cello mm. you had quite a you, you you did the grades and everything and you, mm. you the, the rules of it and everything yeah um, yeah, the cello is such a beautiful instrument. And it's such an emotional instrument as well. It is. Yeah, I, I, I never, I, I don't think I appreciated it at the time. You know, I, I think I was, I was, I was probably learning it for the wrong reasons, um, right. or the the the, the circumstances. Uh, I don't know. It, it just, I think that 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 those circumstances where I felt like I was being sort of pushed probably sort of contributed me to, you know, to giving it up. But it's, it, I mean, I, I bought myself one last year again. Right. And it's, uh, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal instrument. I mean, some of my favorite music now, when I listen to, when I hear there's a cello in it, I'm like, oh my God, this is just, this is just amazing. Mm. But then, and then I think, what a lost opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're, you're right though. If you've, um, I think teaching a, a kid about music, I actually avoid teaching my ki my kids music mm. because it's so got to come from um, a burning motivation, a self-motivation. Self right. um, and I think both of my kids are naturally, um, they, they have that, they have that sort of creative desire yeah. to mess around with music. And I hear... I hear both of them messing around with different instruments that we've got in the house. And I sort of, um, I try and stop myself from going in and going, right, if you just did this, then it would be a major scale. And then you've got your fingers here and blah, blah, blah. I, I try and do like very, very gentle yeah. covering with little things like, oh, you can work out the key of a piece of music by humming the note that sounds most resonant or, yeah, uh, you know, just little tips like that. But um, I've avoided putting them into the rigor of learning the theory and the the scales and everything because I do think that it's um it's very difficult to justify that to a kid to say you know if you, once you've got to the other side of this yeah then there's a world of exploration but I completely agree with you it's kind of putting the cart before the horse it has to it has to come from the it has to come from within you know I I you know, if I if I if I think back to my experience, if I had had been able to have that, if I'd have been allowed to to find my own way with it, you know, like you say, with just just maybe the gentle push in the right direction, or you know, just thinking, you know, just very very kind of nuanced, it, it could well have been a, a different story. My relationship with that instrument. Could well have been very, would, probably would have been very, very different. So I think you're, I think you're totally right in the way that you're approaching it, just based on my experience for sure. I think you know the the cello. It makes me think of Arthur Russell mm. and how he made whole soundscapes by um, distorting and manipulating the sound of the cello. Yeah, um, he's one of my favorite favorite musicians. Yeah. Um, and he's a he's a real influence on on a lot of people now i think i'm hearing mm. stuff that really reminds me of his his work yeah if we go back go back to you know kind of when you when you were a kid and, and sort of growing up and the the you know what you remember as your kind of real formative influences stuff that 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 you remember that that's kind of i guess sort of shaping who you are now mm. what sort of sticks out for you uh, so 
both my parents loved music. Um, my dad was sort of into, <clears throat> he was really into Thin Lizzy. Mm. Um, that, uh, you know, amazing riffs. Amazing. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I heard so much Thin Lizzy and just heard that sort of um, zesty, youthful energy and amazing bass lines just loads of hooks hooks melodies melodies for days um and then he was also into loads of Motown that's a girl group stuff mm. and my mum was much more a folky so she she was into a lot of rock and and blues rock but then she was also into songwriters mm. uh, and <clears throat> she loved you know folky stuff like Donovan and yeah. um, not so much Dylan but more of the kind of kooksy, again, sort of pastoral English stuff like uh, Jethro Tull. Mm. And, yeah, lots of Donovan and, and Mel- uh, Melanie um, and and then a lot of sort of more avant-garde stuff like she loved Captain Beefheart and she loved Bowie and she she sort of, she used to torture me with Bowie actually. She She would always be playing either David Bowie or Donovan when she picked me up from school and she'd be blasting it out of the windows and it'd be embarrassing. But I just, I learned <laughs> all of it after a while. Um, and, oh, she loved uh, oh, the Irish guy, um, Van Morrison. Van Morrison, yeah. But I think, you know, listening to a, a great mix of stuff, dynamic, mm. um, but then also having that, you know, someone like Van Morrison, um, classic, amazing storytelling melodies. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I got a real, I got a, quite a diverse musical. Um, it, it was a lot going on when I was a kid and everyone in my family sang a lot. So my mum was always singing, my grandpa was always singing, just singing around the house, you know, um, the, the 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 house was never silent it was just there was always someone belting a tune out mm. and um whistling so i've i've, I've inherited quite a, a a strong whistle which whistle is, yeah <clears throat> sunseeker there's about three songs that i've ended up whistling on yep um and yeah so that so i got a real mixture of education but then when uh, musical education but then i became very very deeply interested in black music of all description basically mm. so um i spent a lot of time in my bedroom listening to jazz blues delta blues um and then that turned into you know classic funk and then um that turned into gangster rap in a big way i was very very into into rap mm. hip hop and then through that because it was the nineties as well, such an amazing era for R and B. So, yeah. I, 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 I sort of exclusively listened to that style, that's that kind of stuff, mm. until I left home, really. Mm. So yeah, a, a real mix. Yeah, and what 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 sort of <clears throat> people were you sort of hanging out with, and what you you know what what sort of people did you sort of gravitate towards? Um, so my, uh, what I would say is music was a bit of a, it was a bit of an escape from all of that. Um, yeah. I mean, it, uh, I'm quite a sort of introverted person and mm. when I was growing up, uh, I didn't have the greatest time actually. And, um, yeah, I don't have a lot of great memories of you know, sort of mm. bonding with people over music. Unfortunately, it's such a shame. When I was actually growing up in in that in that area, I didn't mm. realize about the music scene. Uh, I didn't realize that there was a scene of people going to to live gigs, and um, and I, and I didn't know about um, Tom's record star. Yeah. Um, we mentioned earlier. I was telling you about the the, the star in my town. Sound it out. Didn't know about Tom. I, and if I could turn the clock back, um, I would have, you know, maybe if I could talk to my younger self, I'd just say, Becky, get down to 
behind Weatherspoons is this amazing place where people hang out and listen to records and there's a guy that can teach you a lot about music um and you know find a find a crowd and find a mm. find a tribe because I didn't yeah. I didn't find a tribe yeah quite an unforgiving place to be mm. <clears throat> a teenager without you know a, a, a tribe of people that are gonna like actually take you under their wing yeah it's it's an interesting one isn't it I mean I, I, you know I was when I was um I, I grew up in um in Chorley in Lancashire and um it was so yeah that you know those, those kind of record shops were were really important you know you, you said you know just kind of spend spend a lot of time there because I'm an only child and it was relatively lonely I'm I'm a kind of you know my my characters I'm an, I'm an introvert as well um when I was a, when I was a kid I was in really shy but I would go down to those sort of places because they interested me because there was a girl else to do as well and um you know digging amongst the crates and, and it was the it was the visuals you know the you know the album artwork <clears throat> that would attract me you know this is like what the early 80s you know, so then, you know all you had was like either the the radio or some you know dodgy nme review or something like that you know so but being attracted by this was just like a really important part but that and and it was almost like a way because because i was like the only child and and you know certainly my my teens i didn't have a lot of friends locally they kind of lived elsewhere and um but those those kind of things gave me the did give me i guess the friendship in a different in a different way it was always it was a world that i sort of wanted to get into if that makes sense <clears throat> yeah and that that was really brave of you you know to turn up mm. as, as an only child just sort of turn up and walk into a a record store and sort of start hanging about it takes so much courage to yeah. do I always remember like when I when I went to, when I first went to uh, uh, no I didn't experience this but when I first went to Liverpool when I became a student in uh, eighty six but a couple of years before the 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 big record shop well the big sort of alternative record shop there was Probe and and you know kind of a few years before Pete Burns was was working there and it's probably sort of fam famous story isn't it? you know he was very sort of spiky yeah that that could have been quite hard going you know sort of going in and. <laughs> picking up a record where you're going to get abuse for buying it yeah at the time when you're a shy kid yeah that's like the that's like yeah. never going to go back here again although i do remember one um one because i did go into one of the stars it it wasn't tom's though it was a, there was another one on the high street and i went in there once and i sang um i sang them the riff to fool's gold by oh wow it's like do 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 little loop did a little loop, did, 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 and they're like, "Oh, it's fool's gold!" And then they got me the they got me that record. Um, Brilliant. And yeah, I must have. I suppose that was quite brave to do that. It was. Um. Yeah, it's a. It's a it's a tricky thing, like being. But then I don't. I wouldn't change the the teen thing because because I got so obsessed with music and it was mm. my world that I got into. It and it and it doesn't leave your head. You know, you 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 sort of load up your brain with all these words and these lyrics and melodies, and they sort of see you through, um, yeah. see you through the day, see you through the week, and in a way, also music gave me because I was really into hip hop and um I, I let slip that I had um I got uh I think we were talking about what did we get for Christmas or something and I said oh, I got Black, Black Sunday by Cypress Hill mm. and uh, I, kn I knew that that earned me some cred a, a little bit of cred among the bully boys at school yeah um <clears throat> so yeah was it was it was there was there a, a a sort of time and a place or a that you can remember as a sort of decision that you made to say okay i'm going to be 
a musician, a songwriter. There was. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um, to, the decision to be a song uh, a songwriter came much, much later. I actually accessed mm. the whole thing, thing through singing. And I, 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 the first thing I wanted was to be a vocalist. So um, I started um, practicing training for that. Um, and then the songwriting thing came much, much later when I was actually, I was doing my music degree and I, mm. and something just clicked and I, I met someone who very, very special to me. Um, and he gave me his old keyboard, a full sized keyboard, which I'd never owned. Yeah. I'd never owned anything that, you know, a proper keyboard with weighted keys and everything. And that was my that was when I was on like the second year of my music degree. Mm. Um, <laughs> Cause the, the, uh, it sounds weird not having a keyboard for a music degree, but cause I'd um, chosen singing. I th- I'm pretty sure the first year it didn't involve us having to compose any, we were literally just singing the whole time. Yeah. And then he gave me this keyboard and I just started like literally for therapeutic purposes, just sort of messing around, didn't know what I was doing, just mm. laying my fingers on keys and making yeah. my cards and, you know, all the black keys make the major pentatonic scale. So I was messing about with that and composing mm. melodies. And he also introduced me to Ableton. And um, this was when Ableton was a kind of new brand and a new thing um, because everyone's using Logic and Cubase, but Ableton was this rare new thing. Um, And and that sort of just, I just started to experiment. And then I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to see where this gets me. But the idea of working and trying to get into music generally, that came very, very young when I was just such a shy kid. Um, but I knew I could sing. I sang in my bedroom. I knew I could sing in tune and in and in harmony because I'd go to Sunday school and hear the other kids singing, and I just think, oh my god, that's awful. And I'd be trying to sort of, I'd be holding the melody, and they'd be all over the place. And I'd, from a very young kid, I'd just think, wow, why can't they hear that they're mm. out, they're out of tune? And and then I could sort of sing thirds above people and. I realized I've got quite a good ear for music and I, I loved it so much that I just decided and didn't tell anyone ever, mm. but it was my own little secret. I'm going to, one day I'm going to get out of this place. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> sing. And then when I, when I finished um, school, I remember sitting at a bus stop on Stockton high street and looking down at my Nike Air Maxes. And I was just hyper focusing on them and just thinking I've got to get out of this town. Mm. And I, I just um I made a decision like I'm gonna do whatever I can to get out. And I found out about this music school down in um Guildford, which at the time I just thought Guildford was London. Yeah. And on this like false idea that I was moving to London, I, I went to Guildford and um did this music course and it just, you know, I passed with distinction and it was like my first little step towards yeah building a musical <clears throat> practice. I mean, for you know, for an introverted kid, I mean that. I mean, it's that's a pretty big deal. You know, do, you know, do, making making that break. But it show, to me that that kind of shows the, I suppose, sort of inherent self belief mm. that you have that you've got you 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 can do this and that you want to do it. Yes, but it's but then going through with it, there's a kind of extra conviction sometimes that you need to to actually go through with it. That's really brave. Yeah, it, I think it's just the sense of I've got there's nothing else for me. Yeah, yeah. It was, growing up in that area in the nineties was hard, and mm. there's there was no other option presented to me, mm. and I was literally desperate. And and then when I moved down to to the south, and then after that, after I did that course in Guildford, I went to music university in London. Mm. Um, it was so hard. I mean, it's so unforgiving trying to forge 
the beginnings, the foundation of a musical career of mm. sorts when all you can do is work to pay the rent and mm. it's so exhausted. It was so hard, but I never even, I couldn't have countenanced the idea of giving up. It just wasn't an option there for me. Yeah. You just, yeah. It's interesting that, you know, that, that love, you know, of, of music, you know, how important it is to you just, you know, just overrides everything. I mean, that's a, it's so fascinating that that it could that 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 can be the your 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 motivator. Yeah, and I've reflected on it more this in the last year or so because I've been mm. doing a lot of um, I've been doing a lot of thinking generally, and uh, I've explored different things. I, 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 I've been extremely lucky that I've been able to my my mind has been entirely taken up by the making the recording the releasing the touring the performing of music and i've i've just been enabled you know somehow or another through all of the different stages i've just been enabled you know i've been allowed to do it and it's been an unbelievable privilege because i i really don't think my mind and the way that my brain works i don't think it would work in more of a conventional career and mm. and I've, I've explored um you know through the um speaking to professionals and stuff i've explored the idea of uh, i think that maybe there might be a bit of a neuro neuro neurodiversity going on yeah with me and uh, i've spent a lot of time thinking about you know my internal world and the way that my my brain's worked in the sort of challenges that I've had since childhood. Yeah. And, it, and, and, um, I, I, I just feel so lucky that I've been able to have a creative career so far because I, I just don't know how I would survive in a predictable sort of routine. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, I think, I think that, that though, those sort of worlds you know the, the the let's call it the you know the business world you know that you know many people go into um is, is very unforgiving and it's very inflexible for neuro neurodiversity you know it's it, it's about in so many ways you know no matter what they say about you know we we have a diversity and inclusion and whatever and all that. it's it's about perfection it's about getting things right and it's about ways of doing things it's rigid processes mm -hmm. and that doesn't i i think that it's it, it's <clears throat> you know it, it, it's sort of being put a put put a lid on so many so many sort of boxes and and you know people so many more people kind of like realizing that that is not that doesn't work for them i do think there is a bit maybe i don't know maybe it's the circles that i now kind of inhabit that makes me sort of realize this but i just sort of feel that those those kind of um structures don't work for so many so many people yeah uh i because the, the, there are things that because i'm like i mentioned to you earlier um i do some lecturing in music mm. a couple of days a week in london and there are some parts of that role that i just realize more and more i don't know if it's because i'm getting older and tireder but there are certain things that don't work for, for me in the way that I think about things. Mm. Uh, luckily, that that those little bits that I have to do, they're they're so fleeting. They they only happen. It's basically marking the work and and grading the work. Yeah. Uh, it, the, there's a process and a formula to it, and that's really useful to rely on. But it takes me so long to yeah. analyze the process. So, and what I got to was. I think I think outwards. So <laughs> instead of thinking forwards, I think I think sideways about everything. Mm. So it takes me ages. If someone like proposes or presents something to me, I don't have an an instant sort of opinion or thought about it. I think sideways for ages, and then finally I bring the focus in, and I have something to say. Yeah. 
and it's just so I can see I can it's almost like I can in a synesthesia sort of way I can see it happening in front of me yeah. so um that's why I'm so blessed to make music because music allows you to do that when I'm writing lyrics I'm never thinking in the room and I'm never thinking forwards I'm I'm thinking in a very abstract wide way so I might be writing a song about one topic but I'm referencing things over there and things behind me and things you know that I don't yeah. write in a direct way and I don't write in a literal way I write in a very cloudy spacey um gaseous way <laughs> it's really it's really interesting you say that because I think um I mean I'm thinking of myself like when I this has happened happened more in the last sort of few years where the, you know I'll be thinking or reading about a particular topic or whatever and then I'll be thinking about how to kind of explain that and my mind will just go off on these sort of tangents mm. and think about okay well what about that what about that what about that or and then that leads to that and then not least and before I know it the topic that I was thinking about it's just kind of mushroomed into something huge and something that I really struggled to then kind of bring back to some sort of context or explanation yeah I, I totally get I totally get that and then you end up just sort of talking yourself out of having a thought about it like yeah a different absolutely and I just I've, I've had it all my life I've I've um I'm somebody who I think I've, I frustrate certain people in my life definitely because I've mm. had the feedback um I don't I don't get to a point um I'm just you know my my brain doesn't work like that my brain doesn't serve me mm. a, 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 a defined sentence or thought I I have to completely go around the houses and bring every bring everyone with me when I'm yeah up with, a, with a, an opinion on something or a judgment of something. Um, so that's why I find marking the students' work very, very, very difficult. And it takes me like three times longer than I'm given. Yeah, I, I, I just cannot like right put the stopwatch on, be strict with yourself, come up with these parameters for your feedback. Yeah, but, um, I just float off into an odyssey of you know, it will remind me of something else and I'll just float off into thinking about that for half an hour. It's, I mean, this isn't really interesting where I have these frameworks, <clears throat> you know, that, that have that have kind of been established and have been established for years and they might have been fine-tuned and, you know, whatever. But they're, they're almost, it feels to me like these these kind of frameworks and uh, institutional in a way, I guess, that that have been created by certain people you know and and they they don't they don't move they don't kind of evolve and i appreciate that there is there's some people for whom um structure is it works for them that you know they can't work with with something else but yeah. it feels like sometimes that the world that we have now in in lots of ways is is far too rigid you right. know whether 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 it's rigid frameworks or or flexible frameworks because they don't work for people. There's there's no ability to sometimes sort of shift outside of those to perform the task that you have in a way that works for you, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And I, and and I I feel sometimes that that's a problem with institutionalization that because they get so big, there has to be frame there have to be frameworks, but they don't always work. They don't often work. Yeah, definitely the 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 education system i mean it works i think it works for a lot of people but there i think we're on the we're in it now where we are discovering more and more that you can't force so some of these kids you just can't force into this small windows of time and yeah. these, the, these type parameters that they're, they're they're not the their brain isn't going to serve serve up results in that way yeah. they need more <clears throat> need more light they need more space and time and and an alter and an ability be be allowed to deliver in a different way and i think i think our, like our world is so much more more kind of nuanced and those those kind of frameworks don't allow for nuances so if you you, you have to kind of give a mark out of 10 you know and and it's 
sorry, okay, well, that, like a mark of six, for example, doesn't perhaps allow for for nuances to be to be kind of represented, or you know, I don't know. Well, luckily, when I when I'm doing my marking, we we do, we get they get a grade and they get loads of feedback. Yeah. And feed forward as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> do, 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 do you do you find that you know your students tend to you know look at the grade and that that's what they kind of focus in on? Um, I'm not. I think that that it's a case by case thing because I've I've done this lecturing stuff for so long, all mm. all, all the way alongside my music career. I've always had one or two days of with this kind of work. And it changes it, and it's quite an international school as well. So they're coming from all over the world. Yeah. So sometimes that's a factor because there, there's different value placed on different stuff. Yeah. Um, but they, they certainly will argue a grade. Yeah. Um, and and then that has to be thought thought about. Mm. But I, I I do I mean I I really agonise over. Mm over the grid you know so I, I definitely put a huge amount of thought into it it's not like I'm just doing it flippantly that, that I mean that that you, you know doing doing that so sort of shows the you know kind of the you know the empathy that, that you have on you know for the for the students for the kids you know the based on you know your, your awareness that what you write has a big big kind of impact yeah which kind of like leads me into you know what the other area that I'm really interested in for you know how we live our lives and the importance of emotional intelligence you know that that you know that our own self-awareness the empathy for others you know about how important that is these days for 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 living you know whether it's in what we do for work or even our, our personal lives feels to me like that is so much more important these days I don't know how you feel about it yeah it's an interesting one um I mean you know I, I have thought about this quite a bit because I think about you know the strikes that are going on mm. uh, the 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 way that care workers are treated and I think about you know what care workers do for a living yeah they 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 pull people together and they they do they do the the tough care that um a lot of a lot of us maybe would be scared of scared of doing yeah and the way that they were treated through the pandemic and the way that they're treated now is shocking um and <clears throat> yeah i mean obviously the it's um caring and empathy is uh we're in we're in a difficult time like we're in a, a very difficult time and and we're the the feeling of empathy and the feeling of see some of the things that we're seeing on the news um it's extremely challenging you know a, yeah. a, a challenging time in history to see people suffering everywhere and yeah. um People, people are having a, a very hard time. I'm seeing it all around me. I'm seeing it among my friends and I'm seeing it among my students. And I'm feeling, I've felt quite fragile for the last couple of years as well. Mm. And I think, um, maybe it's like this sort of late stage capitalism thing of yeah. we've worn ourselves out <clears throat> and, and politics has sort of run aground as well. And there needs to be more there needs to be some time for healing and it and, and it doesn't feel like there is any time i agree I so totally sorry agree. That's, that's a bit of a very random sideways um tangent but yeah when i think about when i think about making space for empathy and compassion uh it just feels like a very very pertinent thing yeah. the moment, isn't it? Yeah, I, I completely agree I remember I'd, uh, a few years ago, I had a I had a chat with a um, a pediatrician in the US, and she was, uh, um, you know, we were kind of talking about. I I basically wanted her to 
I wanted to get her opinion on emotional intelligence and 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 how important it was, um, and uh, and at what what stage. And her her view was absolutely it's one of the most important things that we can we can have, and we need to start teaching it. Right. She was given the example in the US that it's not it's not taught, it's not um, you know it's not on any any kind of curriculums or anything anything like that. But it needs to be taught you know, basically kind of preschool, you know, if you think about, you know, kids before they, you know, they're, they're, they're born with so much, you know, kind of love and, and empathy. And then mm-hmm. as, as you get into the world, it's like, you know, get rid of that, you know, and you can see, so you can see how it sort of goes through, through generations that if it's not, you know, if you don't start somewhere at the earliest sort of stage, yeah. It's going to be just so difficult once you, once those kind of formative influences have started to shape who you are. If that doesn't involve empathy, I mean, it's not always too late, but certainly it helps you talk. You start to, to talking about it at an early age, then we've got to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's definitely um, it's certainly because it, my children are six and eight and so I've Mm. certainly soaked in a huge amount of information I mean there's information coming out me from all directions and Mm. I don't think that's a great thing to be honest it's driven me absolutely mad not knowing you can't see the wood for the trees in terms of how much information you're getting about how to be a good parent and what to teach your children how to speak to them and what how to parent them and yeah um but I but I am seeing um better language around exploring and how you feel talking about how you feel yeah and and I do have conversations with my children about um you know things are all always easier to make sense of if we share with each other how we're feeling even if even if we lose our temper for example which all of us do a lot um if we can it's about how you fix it afterwards it's about how you say how you apologize and then talk about the reason I, I was feeling that yeah. way, feeling very tired at the moment. And I was a bit upset about something that happened earlier on. Yeah. And and just through literally talking to my children like that, hopefully yeah. they, they make, it helps them make more sense about, um make more sense of the way people behave. Yeah. And then maybe they'll, they'll be able to articulate themselves as well because Agreed they're invited to by this the way that we talk to each other in the in the house and yeah and I'm I am seeing that more and more that young children um are ex- expressing how they feel and saying oh, I'm feeling a bit tired at the moment sorry about that I'm sorry mm. about shouting or I'm sorry I threw the toy um so I think it's oh, it's 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 a, a different world to yeah coming up I mean that's a, that's a, that's a good thing that that's that's sort of happening, mm. and you know I mean other you know and other things that 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 kids have like that, um you know curiosity you know how do you sort of curiosity and you know we kind of need to keep as as adults we need to keep hold of that ourselves as well you know constantly mm. sort of curious and sort of exploring new things and I mean it's, again it sort of opens opens minds and yeah. you know helps us to you know get excited about stuff yes and that, and that takes time doesn't it it takes time to allow a kid to ex- to explore and follow a curiosity yeah. yeah um but yes i i i think curiosity is something that um it is another great thing um to be a songwriter to to it's part of the job to be curious about how we can say things yeah. and how we can tell stories <laughs> and what to tell stories about. Um, that's another thing that I love about writing songs is that I get to really try and dig deep and work out how to say something, what language to use, mm. uh, what metaphor to use construct your own metaphor um it's it's just an endless puzzle yeah when you were to, to, to go, going back to you know right at the beginning when we talked about you know, you know your 
the the genesis of the of the new record and the you know use cookie and bombastic and you doing different things i mean how do, how do you um so you know that again so sort of, i guess sort of links into sort of curiosity to explore those sort of things and then how do you feel about um you know taking those risks and those sort of steps i mean would you call yourself a risk taker for example mm, i'm not sure about risk, risk taker i think i'm just uh sometimes i just humor my flights of fancy yeah <laughs> yeah yeah uh and being playful and whether that ends up staying on the record is another is another mm. thing depends on how it turns out when it's recorded yeah yeah um but i don't feel conscious that i'm taking risks as such it's more just that i'm playing and having fun yeah seeing whether i can get away with this thing and then sometimes i'll feel shy and i'll think oh actually no i can't do that lyric let's edit it out and i, I rewrite a lot in the studio yeah i'll change, I'll change lyrics and um I'll rethink certain things. There are certain things on the record that we've sort of dialed down that some of the eccentricities because I've, you know, months later, I just think, oh, that sounds a bit too kooky. Let's get rid of that. Mm. But I'm, I'm probably more risk averse, actually. Yeah. Interesting. And, and, um, oh, over the, over the years, would you say, how, how would you, how would you assess, what you want from life whether it, you, you know you kind of music life or you know as of those um ideals of what you want sort of changed over the over the years yeah i suppose so i think i think it's a natural progression for anyone um, regardless of what they're doing mm. but I think in the earlier years i was trying to please people mm. and, um, demonstrate my prowess or whatever yeah prove myself basically mm. and in more recent years it's I've, lo I've I love the process more so I used to it used yeah. to be able to get the music down because I want to get on stage yeah and now it's um I still love performing on stage but I've fallen deeply in love with the internal world of being a creative person and the, just exploring my exploring my practice basically and um I've I've just totally fallen in love with this idea that I'll just do this for the rest of my life yeah I'll never stop doing it because it's an infinite thing to go into your mind and make something fresh and new and then spit it out it's just an endless it, you can do it forever you could do it forever i mean that's a, that's a great position to be in i, I love that because you know there's so much of the world that's about you know kind of output you know kind of what's the what's the kind of the end product and stuff like that yeah it's not always the the be all and end all actually the, the did just you know kind of the act of doing it so can be so much fun if we if we'd let ourselves yeah absolutely but again i mean it's it's just a massive privilege because you know it's not not everyone gets to you know contemplate their navel for you know, their, agreed. Their, agreed. Uh, yeah that's so very I'm true I suppose, you know, because I come from a very sort of working class background and I'm always tempering my flights of fancy with this idea that this is just a daft thing to do. Like, what, I need, why don't I just go and get a, a normal job? Mm -hmm. And then I bounce back from that and think, well, I just, I'd, I'd go mad. Yeah. But yeah, I used to before I used to go on stage, if there was ever a time where I'd be feeling I'm on tour, I'm playing the same tunes every night, I'm so sick of this, it's all become really monotonous and boring, I can't be bothered to do this again. Mm. I'd go and sit in the toilet and think, think about your dad, Becky. Think about, <laughs> you know, he worked at a power plant for 40 years 
shift work and he never complained and he didn't you know ask for anything more and and that that would be my my um rallying speech that I'd give to myself in the toilet before going on stage yeah yeah but I, I've always been super aware of how you know daft it is to do this for for, for your job or for your work well Becky thanks so much for your time it's been brilliant chat talking to you really great really great chat thanks so much for having me it was really lovely chat